Good evening, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you gathered here today. It's a pleasure to have you all join us for this special occasion. We are honored to have a distinguished speaker, Mr. Tim Boitzer, the international president of the Theosophical Society, as our chief guest, whose presence adds great significance to our event. Mr. Timothy Breckboyd is a Theosophist who was selected the President of the Theosophical Society, ADR, in 2014. He succeeded Radha Bernier, who had been President of the Theosophical Society, ADR, from 1980 until her death in 2013. Mr. Boyd was born in New York City and lived there for 17 years until he went away to college at Brown University. From Brown University, he transferred to the University of Chicago, where he done his graduation in Bachelor of Arts degree in Public Affairs. Mr. Boyd was on October 5, 1974, he joined the Theosophical Society in America. He founded a Theosophical Spiritual Community in Chicago's inner city. In 2007, Boyd became President of the Theosophical Order of the Service, TOS USA. In 2014, he was elected President of the Theosophical Society, ADR, and he assumed office as the 8th International President at the International Headquarters in ADR. He was re-elected to a second seven-year term in 2021. In his capacity as president, Mr. Tim Boyd has demonstrated an unwavering dedication to the society's core values, which include the study and promotion of universal brotherhood, the exploration of spirituality, and the quest for wisdom. He has not only preserved the rich heritage of the Theosophical Society, but has also contributed to its growth and influence in the modern world. Mr. Tim Boyd brings to this position a wealth of knowledge and experience, having devoted a significant portion of his life to the study of theosophy, its teachings, and the practical application. Mr. Boyd has written various articles and publications on theosophy, spirituality, and related topics. His presence here elevates the significance of this occasion and serves a source of motivation for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a warm and enthusiastic welcome to our esteemed chief guest, Mr. Tim Boyd, sir. We are truly honored to have you here with us today, sir. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank my uh, esteemed introducer, Priya, who is a student at our 11th standard at the Olcott Memorial High School, a higher secondary school. I had asked her to do the introduction after we had a sports day at which I was invited to be the chief guest, and always I'm required to say a few words, as I am this evening. But on that occasion, uh, she did the introduction and I thought it was really, I mean, it was, it, it was wonderful in the sense that it is very, very easy to Google Tim Boyd these days and go to a, go to a Wikipedia page and then you've done enough. But uh, the fact that she researched and fought and then she presents so well I just want to thank you for the introduction. I'm uh, quite proud to have it had been you, so thank you. Uh, so tonight, as is the custom, I'd like to share just a few thoughts with you. Um, the subject is a little, I mean, the title is a little bit odd, for me even, the land and us. Um, I, 
there's a story toward how that originated, but we can skip that. But the idea being for me that when you look around the world, the land that we all inhabit is something that universally seems to have great importance. I mean, no matter where we are from, and no matter what point of history we tend to look at, the land is something that is the source of some of the highest uh, human expressions, whether it is heroic patriotism, inspired leadership, you know, you have the motherland, the fatherland, the holy land, the sacred land, have inspired people throughout history to heights of selfless activity. I can remember being in Tibet some years ago, maybe 15, 16 years ago now, a uh, sacred space. And it was a space that was regarded as sacred, of course, by the people who lived there, to the point that there was like a, ritual, a ritualized treatment of the land. So there were places that were sacred. And you would see people every morning doing the kora and during the day where they walk around and do prostrations. And you could tell the people who had been really devoted and really doing it for a long time because the prostrations would involve bowing down, touching your forehead to the earth, and then rising. And there were people who you could look at and they would have a callus in the middle of their forehead from having touched the sacred ground so many times. So it's something that instills this sort of devotion. I can say too that on the other hand, I think we're also all too familiar with the opposite response to land, particularly holy land, fatherland. You know, in our recent history, those very words have sent millions of people marching toward unnecessary death and involving them in unnecessary violence. We find this is something that seems to be repetitive. Just very recently, in fact about two weeks after the, the attack on the people in Israel and after the beginning of the siege of Gaza, my wife and I found ourselves in Egypt. Nothing related to that. It was actually for a theosophical conference uh, that was being held there. And you know, it was kind of remarkable in the sense that it was not the first time I had been in Egypt, but I had been there as a two-year-old and my memories were zero. I didn't remember anything about Egypt. I've seen pictures of myself on a camel in front of the pyramids, you know, all those sorts of things, but memories were not there. I did find, however, that as I walked around, not at the pyramids, but at the marketplace, somehow some sort of memories stirred that somehow I was walking in the footsteps that my father had walked in when he was there. The reason for being in Egypt at this time, it was in 1955, was that my father had taken on the position of mission chief for an organization called CARE, which is an American relief organization. And at that time, it was in the immediate aftermath of the what were then called the Palestine Wars, uh, depending which side of the line you were on, it was the Palestine War, or within Egypt, it, uh, within, excuse me, Israel, it's described as the War of Liberation. But the upshot of that was that hundreds of thousands of Palestinian people were displaced, many of them displaced to Egypt. And so this created a housing crisis, this created a food crisis. So my father was there 
at that time to look to the housing crisis specifically. How do you house uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees in this country? So that's what brought his family there. Uh, and, you know, just thinking about it, it was a reminder to me that, you know, that was almost 70 years ago. And here we're there in 2023, and history repeats itself. The idea that uh, the same thing happening once again. And the question that we must ask ourselves is not just what have we learned, but you know, what is it that seems to uh, attract this response to the places? What is the power of place that influences us in this very strong way? As a high school student in the United States, it's something that everyone is exposed to. What is considered by many one of the greatest speeches given in the English language. And it's a speech that was given by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Civil War wasn't over, this fight uh, between the South and the North that ultimately uh, centered on the issue of slavery uh, was given. Yeah. I can't remember the whole thing, but I remember four score and seven years ago, our fathers founded upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the principle that all men, now we of course we would say all women and men, are created equal. I mean, this is ingrained in my consciousness. His speech was given to dedicate a cemetery, the National Soldiers Cemetery. So it was given to commemorate the death and the dying in war of young people throughout that country. So this response that we have, this obsession with the land and with our association with it that brings out these feelings of not just patriotism, but separation, uh, isolation, racism, uh, colonialism, all of the different things that create hardships in this world historically seem some way to be tied to this uh, view and this approach that we have cultivated to land and space. So, you know, what is it about that? Uh, there is this idea. It was true at the time of the founding of the Theosophical Society. It's true now. There's an idea that says that coming events, things that are not yet here, coming events cast their shadows before them. And it, my experience here lately has been that wherever I go among whoever it is that I find myself, there is somehow this sense of some, something great that is impending that somehow or another we find ourselves on the cusp of some as yet unrevealed something that you can call great. Now the quality of that greatness will of course depend upon what it is that is your particular perspective. And I would think that to the person who is the normal you know, consumer of news as it's presented in news outlets around the world, you know, what they might be envisioning as this great something that is coming might be something that would be a cause for fear in the sense that 
wherever you look, if you're getting your sense of reality from the news reports that surround us, you see war, you see violence, you see pandemic, you see computer cyber attacks. You know, that's the list, and the list goes on beyond that. I mean, of course, we also think in terms of the change in the climate and the effect that that's having upon populations around the world and upon us. So, I mean, to that person, you know, when they look at this great something that might be impending, it's something that arises a sense of trepidation maybe even a sense of fear. There was a recent movie that was done about the life of this great scientist, Robert Oppenheimer. It's a good movie. I actually saw it. It's called Oppenheimer. And he was a gentleman that became quite well known. Uh, in fact, you know, probably the sales of the Bhagavad Gita increased because at the time, his, his function was as the head of the project that produced the atom bomb during World War II. I mean, he was in this unenviable position that the United States was racing to produce this weapon of mass destruction ahead of Germany, who had already started on it long before. So he had this project, and he organized the team. And what he said was this, that at the time that they had the successful experiment where it did work and it worked as they had all conceived it. It was called the Trinity Project. And they were gathered in this desert in uh, Nevada, in Los Alamos desert spot, and it went off. He said both he and everybody around him that had worked on this team knew that in a very fundament fundamental way the world had just changed. Something important had shifted. And you know, so at that time, the phrase that came to his mind was a quote from the Bhagavad Gita, the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where it says, you know, Krishna says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. You know, this was the quote that came up in his mind and that he shared after that. But that's the one that he's probably most famous for. But he had other things that he said and about this whole idea of what is the nature of this great thing that is impending. He said something that to me is, is humorous. Uh, what he said was this. To the mind of the optimist. To the mind of the optimist, we are living in the best of times. Excuse me. He's, the way he described it was, the optimist believes that we are living in the best of times. He said, the pessimist fears that this is true. <laughs> witty. But there is this one way of viewing this impending something that seems to be casting shadows into this world. Obviously, for people of the mind of members of the Theosophical Society, there is another way that this can be viewed. I mean, clearly, there is a greatness that is challenging. Uh, probably you heard when Joss Brooks spoke last night about the challenges that they've had to face in terms of the reclaiming of the environment. But, you know, these are challenges. And that in these moments of challenge, there are always those who are there and who knowingly or unknowingly have prepared themselves to meet and to address the needs of this moment in human history. And so, you know, certainly everybody knows where there are challenges up ahead, but what is it that these things lead toward? The Theosophical Society was founded 
1875, New York City. Actually, it was founded 10 years, which is a very short time. 10 years after the end of the Civil War, 10 years after, the, after what was previously legal and accepted, which is to say the uh, enslavement of other human beings and their sale, 10 years after that was no longer a reality, this society comes into being with this vision of what this world can and should be, should look like. A society that insisted on a universal brotherhood, regardless of caste, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of the many things that we have created as barriers to one another. So this was this founding moment. And it was something that you know, today, you know, the United Nation has adopted the same language that was involved uh, in, in its declaration of human rights. Similar language has been adopted. And these have become more acceptable ideas. So surface level, brotherhood, oneness, is something that is uh, part of the popular dialogue, the popular experience. But the society was founded in this time with a very specific sort of goal that it was supposed to address. In one of the most important uh, of the letters from the Mahatmas that was received for the Theosophical Society is one that's described, it's called the Maha Chohan's letter. And in there, there's some very specific things that are said as to why this society comes into being and what is its value. So one of the things that was said was that at that time, there was a recognition that there was a separation that was occurring. That the, particularly the thinking portion of the human family was becoming divided into two different camps. And one was being influenced by what was described as brutal materialism. So that's the materialism that is, was fully in play based on the science, particularly, of that time, which had become very mechanistic and reductionist. The other avenue was spoken of as degrading superstition. So between these two poles, which were represented largely by the religious pole and the scientific pole, humanity was being divided into camps, and that somehow or another, some third way needed to be introduced that did not have the dogmatic assertions related to either one of those camps. Out of this, this idea came into being that this theosophy and this theosophical society was in fact a need of humanity. And so with that, you found, I, th I think I said at the opening or at some time during the course of this uh, meeting, that when you look and you see the description of the purpose of the Theosophical Society, this organization that we all belong to, or if we don't belong to it, we find value in it. The purpose as stated by H.P. Blavatsky was that it exists to make it known that such a thing as theosophy exists, which, you know, I think I said is a, one of those curious sorts of explanations that H.P. Blavatsky would occasionally give. But, you know, the question to me then becomes, what is it that is found in this theosophy that the knowing of its existence has some power? I mean, she's saying, you make it known that it exists, and that's the function and the purpose here. You've done your work. So what is it that empowers in such a way that there is the possibility of some transformation individually and as a human family? 
And so, you know, this is something that we're called upon to try and think for ourselves. You know, because just to repeat that, it might not get you far. So, what is it? And I think one of the things that this uh, approach speaks to within this whole body of what we think of as theosophy, there's a lot of different things. There are layers and layers and layers that we can address. Uh, Albert Einstein, he was great. I, I don't know how he could churn out so many meaningful quotes, but Albert Einstein has quotes on about everything. And very often, if you're a person who finds yourself speaking to the public, and if you find yourself feeling occasionally inadequate, quote Einstein. <laughs> it's one of those things that can only elevate your, at least your feeling about yourself, even if you don't fool anybody in the audience. But you know, one of the things that Albert Einstein said was that in terms of speaking and thinking about profound things, that we must always endeavor to make everything that we say, probably everything that we do, as simple as possible. As simple as possible. But then, being Einstein, he added, but no simpler. <laughs> as simple as possible, but we don't want to get to the point of being simple-minded. So theosophy is one of those things that very often it's a little bit difficult. We find it difficult for ourselves to simplify. I've been blessed. I have, my wife and I, we have a daughter. Some of you have met her and seen her here or seen her in different places that we've traveled to. When she was a young girl, younger than Priya, she was, for whatever reason, she liked to come when I would be speaking to groups. And, you know, she would always be there in the front row with my wife looking up. And I wouldn't fail, you know, in speaking to say something about her. You know, I'd describe some little thing. And, you know, after the talk, she'd say, Dad, you know, why do you have to mention me? I said, okay. And, but I would still do it. One time I said, okay, I won't mention her. So, you know, after the talk, I hadn't mentioned her, not once, and she had sat through it, enjoyed it. And, uh, but then she comes up to me and said, Dad, you didn't say anything about me. <laughs> you know, you can't win. But beyond that, part of the uh, exercise for me was having spoken, and, you know, she's seven, eight, ten years old, I'd ask her. I said, so, you know, what did you get from those things that were said? And she'd say what she understood. She could very clearly say what she did not understand. And I'd know where my work was. So, you know, some people have come to think and feel that, you know, when I speak, I can speak with some degree of clarity. And not to diminish the stature of anyone here, but that was cultivated by a self-training in speaking in terms that would be understandable by an eight or ten-year-old. <laughs> Not to say that any of us are at that stage. But simple simplicity is probably one of the characteristics of truth. So, what is it about this theosophy that has this potency such that even the knowledge of its existence puts one onto a track that might lead to some deepening? And I think one of the basic things that many people approach this uh, wisdom tradition in search of, knowingly or unknowingly, is some sort of if not answer, at least some sort of development of this essential question, 
which at some point we ask ourselves, who or what am I? You know, who or what am I? You know, this was the uh, uh, Ramana Maharshi's exercise. You know, who or what am I? But in this theosophical body of knowledge, that is one of the things that is central to it. You know, whether you feel the need to go into uh, some specificity about the seven planes of nature or the uh, involutionary and evolutionary aspects of this journey, with or without that, there is this, a certain clarity about this question of who and what am I? Because one of the things, and I find myself saying this often, and perhaps too often, but I do it because to me it is one of these essential truths that have meaning to me and make it possible to work with this wisdom. You know, the question of what is the human being, or who am I, is answered in this way, that the human being, therefore I, am highest spirit and lowest matter linked by mind. It's simple enough, but the depths that that speaks to and the potentials within us that that speaks to and the areas where we need to put the focus of our attention in unfoldment that that speaks to are profound. I mean, spirit matter linked by mind. Mind is the ground where we can work and where something can occur. This spirit and this matter with this mind as the messenger between the two. Generally, you know, we focus on the lower uses of the mind thinking about the world around us and how we might be able to manipulate it to our advantage. Normally is one of the ways that we view it. But this mind, uh, Joss Brooks made this expression about part of what we're here to do is to spiritualize matter. I mean, it's a fu funny term in many ways, but actually the mind as the messenger delivers those influences, those spiritual influences that bring a spirituality, the influence of spirituality into the material world. We witness it where we have communities or people who root themselves in kindness. Their approach to the animal, to the plants, to the people is rooted in kindness. Kindness is not a material property. So this spiritualizing of the world of matter. Equally, you know, one of the things that comes with being the president of an organization that relates to spirituality is that you necessarily are in touch with people with a variety of views, some of them quite different. Uh, and so you have people who are perhaps spiritually awakened, but severely imbalanced. You know, it's not all one or the other. The human being is all of these. Spirit, matter, mind. So this description. So mind as the messenger equally has this capacity to stabilize spiritual expression. And the cultivation of the mind occurs in this moving to and from these poles of our own existence. The way H.P. Blavatsky described it, she talked about these three aspects. She described it as three schemes of evolution. And so these three poles, which we could actually talk about as three 
You know, just as we talk about the material world and the land that we associate with there, we live in other lands as well. Just by virtue of being a human being, there is the land of spirit, there is the land of matter, there is the land of mind that we inhabit at every moment at every time. The way she described it, this is to say H.P. Blavatsky, is that these three schemes are inextricably interwoven and interblended at every point. It's not our normal view. I mean, I think we tend to think in terms of layers. You know, there's spirit, there's matter, there's mind in between, and you know, we're dealing with layers inextricably interwoven and interblended at every point. Which means that to the extent that we are physical beings, we are equally mental, we are equally spiritual beings. Our forgetfulness and our lack of association with this profound truth limits our capacities to bring this spiritualizing influence into the world of matter. So that's something of the power of this whole thing that we think of as theosophy and the power of merely a knowledge of its existence in this world, what that can bring. All right, so what then might be our role. You know, to those of us who have found some uh, value in this approach, to those of us who have even had the experience of this, it's one thing that's quite true, that the knowledge of this threefold nature of our being has a certain power. And it has a power that is attractive. It's magnetic in many ways. To the extent that we become close to it, we find that it affects us. Often I use the example of a bar of iron, you know, a cold piece of iron. You put it in front of a fireplace and leave it there. And this cold iron is influenced by its proximity to the fire. In the spiritual approaches, we think in terms of the teacher or the master or the guru, that our presence, to be in the presence of, wordlessly, has its effect. So there is that aspect of it. But then, too, one of the things that becomes clear, particularly to those who have actually persisted who have done the thought, who have attempted to enter into some stillness around this thought, invariably there is another unfoldment that necessarily takes place. And it's the unfoldment that you could describe as actual experience of. And that experience, you know, the problem with really seeing anything. You know, even if it's just with a person, if you really see that this person is really no good for you, then that's something that you cannot unsee. And the problems that many people face with trying to live a life that they might describe as normal and connected to the normal habits of mind is that once we have peeked beyond a certain veil, and actually seen and experienced, you can't unsee it. And it has this quality of shifting, of reordering our priorities. Certain things that might have once been important cease to have the same importance. And you can't do anything about it, except you know, deliberately try to deny. I mean, for many people, the uh, Many people often will try to mask such a thing because it just seems too drastic. And, you know, you find substance abuse and various things to try and dull various levels of realization. 
So there is that aspect of it. But what do we do? I mean, once we find that there is genuine value and that perhaps we are much more than we had previously denied ourselves in terms of our capacities, then what? You know, what is our role? And within the context of the work that we do, this theosophical society, I think I could say that our role, uh, Radha put it in terms of the regeneration of human regeneration, and you could even say regeneration of the mind, because that's the substance that directs it. So regeneration. And like everything, it's a true way of putting it, but then what does it mean? But if, in fact, there is some degree of this regenerative effect on our minds, then, you know, how does anybody know that? You know, it's very easy for us as theosophists to talk about very high matters and to refer to those. And, but then I've had the question, you know, what do you do? <laughs> what do you theosophists do? And, you know, sometimes it's a little unsettling. It can be because you end up describing the talks that we give or the uh, meetings that we have. But it's become my uh, growing conclusion that regeneration, if it has any reality in, your, in you, in us, necessarily it has to reveal itself in our environment. So in the ways that we conduct ourselves with each other, with people, with the broader environment, it's something that must be seen. And so, you know, part of what it is that we have been attempting here, Adyar, is this aspect of a regeneration rooted in the mind, rooted in the spirit, but rooted in the land, rooted in the activities that we perform together. You know, many of you have been coming here for a long time. I've seen you. We've gotten to know each other. And it's a wonderful thing. Most of you, your history goes back much farther than my history with Adyar. But one of the things that, with my new eyes coming to Adyar, it was clear that certain things were required of us. You know, not merely to study, but to apply it in ways that have meaning and that are initially had to be actually visible. You know, we were faced with, and it's not complicated. Again, a lot of this is so simple that, you know, to not follow along this line, uh, we almost have to blame ourselves. It's deliberate. So here, again, because it was so clear and so obvious. You begin where you are. So it was, you know, there's no question about it. We had structures that demanded repair, that demanded upgrading. You know, the level of the appreciation of this place, yes, it's a place that is infused with the presence of great people. When you walk on the ground, it breathes itself into you. We know that. But not only should it breathe itself into you, but it has to breathe itself out of you as well and show itself in the world that you create. So we started there. I mean, we, would have, we had things, again, simple, obvious. On this campus, there was you know, some discontent with the way other people treated our campus. We, it wasn't felt that it was respected properly. You know, so such things as people dropping trash, walkers and things like that, dropping trash on the campus. Again, not having had the benefit of 
long association, you know, you look around and you, know, you ask a question. Where are the garbage bins on our campus? There were none. None. So, you know, we demand a respect, but we can't help people to cooperate with that. Garbage bins, you know now, are everywhere, and we, it used to say, it's been so long that they've been there, we used to, we put them up and we put on, had written on them, use me. <laughs> and people did. You know, this is a different thing, but there was a problem because people were concerned about odors near our gates. You know, we have walkers that would come and their drivers would drop them here. And, you know, there was a question about people, you know, urinating against the wall of the campus. Very disrespectful. But then the alternative question is, where are the restrooms? Where are the toilets? We built toilets. The problem, of course, ceased. I mean, these are very basic, very fundamental things. But as we were able to move along, other things started to reveal themselves. And the thing is this. There is this idea that everything that is now real was once imagined. Whatever it is, from the chair we're sitting on to the clothes we wear to this tent, you know, everything that is now real was once imagined. And this reality that we walk through is the product of imagination brought down to earth. And so we have been in a process of reimagining this place that is our home. And what does that mean? You know, what are the effects of this imagination? I mean, so there's a lot of different things. I mean, we have the, many of you, I hope, have visited the uh, exhibit that we have at the Adyar Library and the exhibit that we have at the archives. The archives, many of you know, used to be right over here in the headquarters building. Uh, we moved and we linked the archives with the Adyar Library and Research Center in a beautiful situation away from the river. And now it's a first class operation. You know, we re envisioned and repurposed the former. Theosophical Publishing House just across the road. It was something that in its day had more than 100 employees working between there and the Vasanta Press. Nowadays, of course, computerized printing operations well, involve one or two people. And it can also be outsourced. So that building was sitting there servicing something that it was not developed to, that was not developed to occupy it. Repurposed that into the Adyar Theosophical Academy, which is flourishing, and that's something that has been done. Simpler things. You know, this convention, those of you who have been coming for years will know that it used to take, it began just the day after Christmas, the 26th. That also happened to coincide with this arts and festival season, dance festival season here in Chennai. So you know, it is not untrue to say that many of our members came here and they would you know, spend a little time with our meetings here, but then really go out and enjoy the uh, dance performances that were happening, high quality dance all around Edgar. We delinked those two things. So by moving our convention a little bit later, the people who were coming became fewer in number. But they were coming for this. This was the reason for being here. The people that are infused with this could come together without a needless distraction. If you want to go to the, uh, uh, the dance festival, sure, come early and go on your own. But this is what this is about. We took all of our, all of you will know that we took uh, 
a lot of attention to the accommodations here. And, you know, these are things that in a way are physical, but it's much more than that. You know, one of the things we insisted upon was that the accommodations for the people that are coming here are going to have to be suitable to your comfort and to, you know, normal sorts of standards. We insisted upon it, and we've upgraded it to that point. We've equally insisted that nobody's going to be overcrowded. Again, the numbers of people go down. But this has been one of the things. I, you know, I sometimes say it jokingly, but really I'm not joking at all when I talk about our Bangalore City Group. <laughs> I think any of you that uh, have eaten here, have eaten with our Bangalore City Group, uh, it used to be the food that was provided was, it was provided by people who just didn't care. You know, it was a contract. Uh, had them take that over, and it's not just a matter of the quality of food. You know, because I happen to know, having conducted conventions in the United States and here and elsewhere, you can have the best speakers in the world, but if the food isn't good, <laughs> you know, you, you people know, you all like good food, the convention's a failure. <laughs> But it's not even just about that. Of course, it's the highest level of food. But the attention to the needs of the brothers and sisters of people who are here, the kindness that is exhibited throughout, the prayers that are said before the meals are served, the elevation of our whole approach and attitude to food, is what that's really about. We're fortunate that along with it, we get to eat well. <laughs> but I mean, these are things that appear, again, seemingly outwardly. But here's the thing. At this point, we find ourselves again. In many ways, we are arriving at another cusp, moving toward a future. I hope that all of you were able to be here last night to get a chance to hear Joss Brooks talk about the work that he's done with the gardens of South India and the forest that was created out of absolutely nothing in uh, near uh, Oroville. At this point, one of the things that we are in the process of is reimagining this space in a different way. The work that Joss Brooks and his people had to do in uh, near Pondicherry in the Pichandikalam forest, which before was just a Pichandikalam flat land. It took them about three decades to accomplish that. I assume and I hope that all of you take the opportunity while you're here to walk around this campus and to take advantage of its rich green life and the pathways that are here within that. Here there is a forest that has come into being uh, really, it has been planted and it has been developed by the birds who eat seeds and drop them here, by the animals who eat foods and drop those seeds here, and by time. The work that 30 years it took for them to accomplish has been accomplished here in many ways through our benign neglect. <laughs> but what we have here is a resource. Here's the thing. Theosophical Society has a statement of its mission. And that mission is described, the first words of it, it's, it's 24 words to the entire mission statement. 
I encourage everybody to acquaint yourself with that. If you can remember three phone numbers, you can remember that. Of course, now, you know, I can't blame anybody because now with cell phones, I don't remember three phone numbers. <laughs> if you ask me mine, I'll have to text it to you somehow. But 24 words, to serve humanity by cultivating an ever-deepening understanding and realization of the ageless wisdom, spiritual self-transformation, and the unity of all life. That's the mission statement. But as an organization whose mission is to serve humanity, the question again becomes, how do we do that? I think I indicated at our opening that the conclusion we have arrived to, at least here, is that the way that that is accomplished is by any and every available means. And so, recently, for us, although it's been a part of our history from the beginning, the arts. I mean, you heard the presentation from Elif and Anupama the other night and uh, Erica about the arts and the sort of renaissance that's taking place here. And the way it's taking place is because we are reacquainting ourselves with a rich heritage that has been running through this place from its beginnings. It's not like we're suddenly starting into something with art. We have works of art that are critical and examples of various art movements influenced by this place and by theosophy. And that's something that is making itself more and more clear. So we, with these things, there is this process of required restoration we've had to go into because we haven't treated it very well. Not because we deliberately didn't, but because we have been ill-equipped. And so this restoration project, like many of the things that we do, exceeds the internal capabilities that we have here at Adyar. And so in a sense, it necessarily draws in others to associate with this work. One of the features of this drawing in of others has been the supervisor of our restoration project, uh, Ms. Mrs. Elif Kamisli from Istanbul, Turkey. And I have to say, she's a person first became acquainted with through email in 2014 because she was involved in a biennial art exhibition in Istanbul. And what they were after was the thought form paintings, which we didn't have. We found them later. But out of that association, she became more deeply acquainted with this place, with its impact, with the something related to the value of this thing, as you know, we individually value it. What began as others assisting in the work now is you know, one of us <laughs> taking on this work. And it has this quality. Every single thing of any importance that the Theosophical Society has accomplished in its almost 150-year history has been the result of a dream. A dream. We dream a world. We populate that world with the characters of our dreaming. Nothing is on the ground as yet, but we dream. The dream of HPB as well as the dream of the masters, that there is the potential for a world that is somehow grounded in a sense of brotherhood, is a dream that has attracted some of the finest minds that there are. But invariably, our experience has been that 
the dream, you dream a world, and from all around, the resources required to bring that world down to earth and to expand upon it find their way to live inside of this dream. It's the way it works, and it sound, might sound airy-fairy to some. It's the fact of the way we do and have operated. So now we're in a new phase of our dreaming. This place has these wonderful forests that is an ecological resource at a time when such things are deeply needed. And, you know, we're not just talking about a park. We're not just talking about... But there is a consciousness that exudes from the association and the appreciation and the cultivation and the extension of our intimate association with the natural world. This is a direction that we're going to be moving in. Joss Brooks had spoken with him, and he has been here to visit this place and to assist in developing a plan. But I have to say, after last night's talk by Joss Brooks, I was approached, and the point was made, and it was a good point. Very, very inspired person, inspired by the passion and the knowledge that Joss exudes, came up to me after the talk and said, please, do not let this end as just a talk. It was a good talk. It was a beautiful vision. Don't let it end as just a talk. I had to interrupt to say that the fact of the matter is this, that Joss Brooks was here because for months we have been thinking our way into this, dreaming our way into this different world this different approach. And without knowing Joss Brooks or the breadth and scope of his work, this dream had taken shape. And so this is something that we, it's going to happen. This place is going to be a jewel, a refuge for animal and wildlife, an educational tool for the people who are living on a planet that's burning itself up day by day. An education about another way, and every bit of it relates to this sense of oneness. Mahatma Gandhi, he wrote his autobiography. And I think the title of his autobiography was really quite brilliant and true. Because his autobiography, it's called Autobiography, My Experiments with Truth. My Experiments with Truth. This Theosophical Society, this Adyar campus is an experiment. It's an experiment. It's something that had not been tried, had not existed. It was thought that it would wither and die on the vine. It's an experiment to try to bring something, exemplify something in a world in deep need. The immediate results necessarily are uncertain. You know, Will we help in bringing the world back from the brink of its own destruction? You know, heedless misuse of the resources of this planet. You know, just completely brutal and unthinking approaches to whole populations of people. The last time I checked it, I think, about, I think it was about the 25th. There are about 200 nations in the world and the 25th, something in the 20s, 22nd, 23rd, 25th largest nation is a nation of people with no nation. Refugees, gone from their homes. Why? Uh, often it's gone because of uh, water. There is none. 
because the ground has dried up. You know, climate migrants. So, you know, into this world is where we have to have this, this experiment. And the experiment also relates to the unity of humanity. So short term, it's uncertain. I would really like to think, and I really would be more comfortable if I could feel that you know, human behavior will curb itself and move away from the sort of excessive denial of the destructive aspects that we're having on the planet. That's the possibility that we move toward. But short term, we'll see. But long term, there are some things that we can say are certain. And these are the things that I think we really need to root ourselves in. It is a certainty that no effort is wasted. It is not in keeping with the economy of nature that anything that we do in our thoughts and in our actions is wasted. It is a certainty that there are great beings whose attention and whose caring and whose influence in this world aids and supports the efforts that move toward their purposes, great beings. To us, we think in terms of the masters of the wisdom. It is a certainty that each and every one of us can be instrumental in bringing about the changes that will bring this dream to earth. These are the certainties. These are the things over which we have some control. These are the things that to a certain degree we need to dedicate our efforts. So the land and us. The process is to move beyond knowledge to awareness. To move with that awareness to conscious application, conscious applied activities that will uplift wherever we find ourselves. If in fact there's some degree of regeneration, if in fact there's some degree of connection to the depths that this theosophy speaks about, it should be revealed in any and in everything that we touch. That's our responsibility. And so with that, I think I will thank you for your attention. I will thank you more when we commit ourselves ever more deeply to such things. But I can say that it's completely something that is doable. Here at Adyar, you know, just in the small ways that we have had to address matters, you know, so many of the things that we faced were impossible. You know, you looked at it, there's no money to do it, there's no, you know, there's no expertise to do it, impossible. So it's impossible, so what do you do? You keep on going and then you ultimately, you do it. And so we're at this point now, I think I've said it before, where we find ourselves looking for the next impossibility. <laughs> and no doubt we find it. But again, the idea is that we're in this all together. So once again, I thank you and I appreciate everything that you bring to this effort. Let's bring more. Thank you.